edition of uh, Game Funding Bootcamp by SGA, uh, realized in partnership with um, our um, uh, our partners, obviously, uh, SwissCP, uh, Karanovic and Partners, uh, Deloitte uh, Serbia, and also uh, Help Serbia through the Reconomy uh, project. So. Um, obviously, I'm talking in English because we have an international um, uh, episode uh, today. Uh, so in the past two um, editions, we dealt with uh, public funding and uh, publish publishing as a tool for financing uh, uh, game dev projects. Uh, today, we are uh, going from a slightly uh, different angle. So we're going to focus on uh, crowdfunding. Um, and uh, SGA has covered the topic uh, in a couple of programs uh, before uh, over the years, but now we are super happy to have uh, Jess Bailey with us today from Crowdfunding360 from the UK. Uh, so Jess is an independent expert on uh, crowdfunding and has delivered a number of uh, trainings and uh, workshops across the Balkans and beyond. Um, and uh, her workshop is going to take around uh, one and a half hours today with also some uh, practical uh, exercises. And then after that, we're also going to welcome uh, Dusan Vulovic from um, uh, Dobri Dabar, a uh, new platform from, for crowdfunding um, uh, that has been set up in Serbia quite recently. And then also we're going to have uh, Ivan Rajkovic as our guest, um, who is... Uh, one of the co-creators of Forest of Radgost uh, board game uh, that is one of the definitely most successful uh, Serbian campaigns on uh, Kickstarter and definitely from the gaming sphere uh, with um, $300,000 uh, raised from uh, more than 3,000 uh, backers. So those two will be short Q&As kind of um, uh, first-hand um, experiences and of course all of you who are with us today, uh, you'll be able to uh, ask questions uh, to any of our guests. So um, uh, feel free uh, to do so, and I encourage you to do so. So without further, further ado, uh, Jess, thanks for being with us uh, today. And uh, thanks uh, for sharing your uh, knowledge of the field and uh, your experience. So I'm going to give the uh, floor uh, to you. Great, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. I just put a quick note in the chat box that we're going to be using the chat function quite a bit in the workshop, as well as obviously feel free to also be taking your mics off. If you want to put your cameras on, then put them on. I like seeing faces. That always makes me e happier and uh, easier to flow to make sure that you I kind of know what's going on. But just in the chat box, if you want to write your name and then either, you know, what your project is or what your game is that you're going to be thinking about crowdfunding for, then that will be good because the first activities coming up very shortly are just in relation to you, your projects and the chat box. The more I know about your projects also, the easier it is for me to provide tailored advice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. So you should all be able to see my screen. I'm just going to move the cameras and the chat box so that I can stay up to date with everything that's going on as well. OK, so we're, today we're going to be looking at crowdfunding. So who am I as um, so nicely introduced. I'm Jess. I'm the founder of Crowdfund360, and we are an independent consultancy that help projects crowdfund successfully. So this, uh, this is any type of project. We're agnostic of the platforms, but we help clients from start all the way through to the end. Um, we've done a lot in the Balkans, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Macedonia, Albania run a lot of workshops for Swiss EP, both in the past, uh, in person, and also online in this COVID time. So what I want to know from you is really about what your information about crowdfunding is. So if in the chat box, you can tell me, number one, have you ever tried crowdfunding before? Number two, have you ever backed a crowdfunding campaign before? And number three, do you know someone that is crowded? 
So I'll just take a short time here. In the chat box, just write, you know, number one, yes or no, number two, yes or no, and number three, yes or no. And this also will help me to like understand how many of you are actually, you know, there listening and uh, participating. So I'll just give it a few seconds. So Andrew has tried Indiegogo as a trial campaign just to see how it works, but he or she has not backed a campaign before or know someone that's crowdfunded. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Okay, so the reason that I've asked this is if you've tried crowdfunding before, you're going to have some sort of idea about it. If you've backed a crowdfunding camp campaign before, that's great. You're going to have some experience from the backer's perspective. If you have never backed a crowdfunding campaign before and you actually want to go and run a crowdfunding campaign at some point, I really strongly recommend going and backing a campaign of something of slight interest just to understand it from the audience's perspective. It's going to really help you in the long term. So what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is the practice of funding a project by raising many small amounts of money from a large number of people in a particular time period. And that time period is really important because we all have that friend that says, I'll give you money next week, I'll give you money next week, and then next week never actually comes. It's typically via the internet, although it doesn't have to be. However, when we're looking at the markets in the Balkans, we're going to be mostly using the internet because chances are we're going to be trying to get people from other countries to also back our campaign. So why crowdfund? Obviously, get money. Yay, that's the best thing about crowdfunding in most people's opinions. But actually, you also want to be building your audience. Crowdfunding is great to build your customer base. Crowdfunding is great to market your organization. You're going to be getting way more brand awareness and PR, etc., from your crowdfunding campaign. It's also good to get new customers, as I said, and also social validation. Having a successful crowdfunding campaign really helps to get other forms of funding later on, really helps when you're going for investment. So here's just an example. If you've never seen a crowdfunding campaign before, although chances are you probably have, but this is just what it would look like. So this is Scorn, and this would be the page that people would see. As you can see, you've got 5,636 backers pledging 192,000 euros that brought that project to life. So what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding, a successful crowdfunding campaign is strategy, creative content, and audience psychology. Money doesn't grow on trees, it's no free money, and it's not just going out into the public and the wider world and begging for money or asking random people to support you. You have to follow the strategy, give creative content and always think of the psychology of your audience. And those are the things that we're gonna be focusing on today. Crowdfunding is definitely not magic, luck or easy. And those are three things I really want you to remember throughout your whole process. So there's three different types of crowdfunding. There's donation crowdfunding, rewards crowdfunding, and equity crowdfunding. Donation crowdfunding wouldn't really work well for the gaming industry because it's just giving to a good cause. Most gaming industries and games, you're wanting to make money. So chances are you would be using the rewards crowdfunding. You're getting customers. Or you might be at the stage where you're looking for equity crowdfunding and you're getting investors. The typical raise for a re rewards campaign is 15,000 euros, although obviously we've seen there have been huge campaigns uh, from that. Our average is 34,000 euros, but obviously it can go up into the hundreds of thousands, but that's really if there's a strong advertising monetary spend behind it. 
these are the figures when we're looking at not putting any ad spend in. And then equity crowdfunding, your absolute minimum that you'd be going for is really 150,000. There's also two different types of crowdfunding in terms of flexi funding and all or nothing funding. And the flexi funding means that you take however much you make. And the all or nothing means you only take your target, you only take your money if you hit your funding target of 100% and go over. So what I want you to do is just think about yourself. Would you be doing donations, rewards, or equity? And also, would you choose to be doing it as flexi funding or all or nothing? Again, I'll just give a couple of seconds for the chat box. If you can put your answers in there, that would be great. If you also have any questions that come up for me during this uh, workshop about crowdfunding in general, then feel free to put them in the chat box as well. I want to see some uh, more interaction in the chat box so I know that you guys can all hear me uh, and what I'm saying makes sense. So Stefan is saying rewards and flexi funding. That makes sense. Andrea, would you be choosing donations, rewards or equity crowdfunding? And then would you be choosing flexi funding or all or nothing? I'd say that rewards and flexi funding is the most popular version of crowdfunding that could be done for your situations. So what I want you to do for the rest of the workshop is really think about your type of crowdfunding for your situation. So think about, OK, I'm doing a rewards flexi funding campaign for this project and everything else that we now build on on top of this. I want you to just think back to your particular project so that you can get the most out of this workshop. So most campaigns fail. In the Balkans, less than 10% of campaigns actually hit their target. Our success rate's over 80%. So if you follow the art strategy, you have a much higher chance of hitting your target. Even just one spelling error decreases your chance of being funded. So if you're writing it in English, send it over to me, get another native English speaker to be checking your English just to make sure that you spell everything correctly. Obviously, having a video increases your chance of being funded. And my favorite thing here is 42% of funds are raised in the first and last three days of the campaign because it's new and exciting. And then suddenly there's the urgency to give money. Why do I have hashtag crowdfund February here? Well, just like how different months have different themes, we have one in crowdfunding of crowdfund February, where every day I give another statistic about crowdfunding. Obviously, it's just ended now, but we have a whole blog post with all of these little snippets, and they can really help just make your campaign succeed, make your campaign a little bit easier. Because these statistics really don't lie. I've done 80 campaigns and I see that they actually work each and every time. So there's six key stages to a crowdfunding campaign. And that's what we're going to really look at today. It's the intro and the planning. It's the storytelling and it's the building the crowd. And those three sections come so early before you even tell the world that you're thinking you might do crowdfunding. Then you start building your project page, start communicating about the campaign. Then you start running the campaign. Now, we usually do these five sections in the two or three months before launching the campaign. You then have your crowdfunding campaign that lasts for five weeks. And then at the end, we have the follow up section, which lasts until the project is complete, until your game has been made and the rewards have all been sent out to make sure that everyone has a great experience in giving you their money. So what do we mean by all of these? What do we actually need to plan? So we need to really plan like the timeline. As you can see here, there's a game with a snowboarder. We would not be wanting to launch this campaign in like June. The world in the Northern Hemisphere is not thinking about snowboarding in June. So we need to think like, where, where are we targeting these games? What is our audience thinking about? If we're doing a football game and we're launching it around the same time that the World Cup or the Euros happens, 100% we're raising more money than we would in any other year. 
So we can use the timeline to work in our favor, or we can launch at the wrong time and make our life a lot harder. All of these small things just make our lives a few percent easier, and then they all add up at the end. You also really need to plan out your team. Who is helping you? You really can't do this yourself because you need different skill sets. You need networkers, you need designers, you need videographers, you need marketers. On top of all that, obviously, you need illustrators and game developers for your game. But campaign teams with four or more people raise double that of solo campaigners. And that's not only because of their skills, but it's also because they're all bringing in separate networks as well. We also need to plan what platform we're using, who is, back, who is backing us, and obviously what content is going out. A really great question from Igor in the chat. Should rewards be considered earlier in the develop of the game and equity later on? Yes, that's 100% correct, Igor. You want to start off the, with the rewards to bring in the customers so that when you go in to deliver your, uh, to run your equity campaign, you've got that proof. Just like you said, there's traction already. The investors can see you've already got customers and thus it's an easier sell for them. You can then do another rewards campaign later on once you've got the investors because you might want to release a new game and get more customers in. But in general, yeah. Rewards should always come like before equity, never equity before rewards. So here's a bunch of platforms. We've already had Andrea mention Indiegogo. Which of these other platforms might you consider using? Again, just throw them in the chat box, which ones you might consider using. There's over 2000 platforms in the world, but there's probably less than like 10 that you should actually consider using. I mean, like WordPress has a plugin for a, a crowdfunding platform. I wouldn't be using them. If your audience doesn't know or trust the platform, they're not going to give it money. So that's really one of your most important things. When we're looking at what platforms we should be using for games and for you guys, I would say Kickstarter and Indiegogo are your two best choices, and they are rewards crowdfunding. Kickstarter is rewards crowdfunding, only all or nothing, and has a much higher male demographic. So if your game is a lot more targeted to men, that would be a better option for you. Indiegogo, you can choose whether it's going to be flexi funding or all or nothing, but it has a slightly higher female demographic. So if your campaign, if your game is more focused at kids or women, that would be a slightly better platform for you. GoFundMe is there, but I can 100% say, please never use GoFundMe. It's full of so many scam campaigns that yours is just really gonna get lost and people are just not going to trust you half as much. Seedblink is an equity platform that you might consider using. We helped a Kosovan campaign on there recently and they're headed out of Romania, I believe. So really think about what platform you're going to use. Once you've thought about what platform you're going to use, and of course, if you have any questions about platforms, then just put them in the, the chat box. But you also then need to think about how much you're going to raise. So how much do you want to raise as a minimum? And this is really important, especially if you do all or nothing, you want to make sure you know what the minimum is, because that's probably going to be your actual target. You then want to think what is an ideal amount and probably how much you're going to raise is in between those two. Don't forget to add your platform fee and any payment fees. Otherwise, that's really going to sting you at the end. So as an example, if you wanted to raise 10,000 euros and the platform and the Stripe fees add up to 8%, you actually need to raise 10,800 euros. Now the average pledge to a crowdfunding campaign is 25 euros or dollars or pounds. And so then you would need 432 people to back your campaign. At the absolute minimum, you need to know where 40% of that funding is coming from before you click launch. 
because no one really trusts a campaign that's less than 40% funded, and we'll go on to look at that. But that means you need 4,320, divide that by 25 pounds, and you'd need 173 backers. Does that make sense to everyone? If you've got any questions, as I said, just put them in the chat box. Or if you want to speak your question, then just put it in the chat box that you want to speak your question, and I can give you that time without uh, speaking over you or something. So really look at the maths of how much you want to raise and figuring out how many people you need to give you money. We then need to think about the story that we're telling. Now, storytelling and crowdfunding is so important. It's probably like the main thing that's going to get people to pay money into your campaign that's not yet made. Why is this game actually going to be really great? Who are these people that have made it? What's the story of the game? Now, this is just a really great little picture that I like to use because so often this happens with crowdfunding. How the customer explained it is very different to how it looks in reality and how it's been designed. And then that's very different to what the customer really wants. And the more that that difference is happening, the less likely they are to give you the money. So you really got to explain it well, design it well, and give it to the customer well so that they turn into backers. Remember, you only have five weeks to get their money. We can't be going round and round in circles of confusion. So what is your game? You've mentioned it slightly to me, but now I want to read it in just five sentences only. So what is your game? Where does it take place? Either like in the fantasy world or at your dining table with friends, that sort of thing. Who can play the game? When is it coming out? And how is it being made? Is it a board game, a video game, some other game? So I'm going to give you a few minutes now just to finish up and write up those sentences in the chat box. What is your game? Where is your game set or played? Who plays your game? When is it available? When is it played? And how? How is it played? I only want five sentences. Literally, that is how short the campaign key messaging should be. If anyone has any questions at this point, feel free to unmute themselves. Otherwise, I'm just going to assume that you guys are all like writing. Okay, Andrea's, Andrea's written. That's good. PC 2D story adventure. In a fantasy world coming out in winter 2023. And Andrea, who is it for? What type of person is going to be wanting to play your game? Okay, just give one more minute, finish up your five sentences and send them on over. OK, so once you've got your five sentences and your story that you're telling, 
where are you going to be using that? You're going to be using it in pitching, whether that's in person, online, in a video. You're going to be using it on your crowdfunding page, in your crowdfunding video, as I said. You're going to be using this for all the photos. Every single sentence that you write for your campaign, you need to think, how can I show this in a visual way? How can I show this through a photo? How can I show this through an illustration? This is going to, your story is going to be shared on your social media, throughout your email marketing, and of course, in PR. So Dragomir has also just given his information. So what is it? It's an RPG. Where is it? It's in the modern world. Who? PG7. When? In the next two years. How? Video game for PC and Switch with a possibility of a board model. Great. So you would only want to be like crowdfunding either the video game or the board model. Maybe the board model could come later with stretch goals, but just focusing on one at the particular moment. And then Andrea's also just added in who their target market is, the 18 to 30 male, female fantasy lovers. That is their target market. Igor's putting it in two. Great. So hardcore and casual players alike. I'm going to say kind of two quite separate target markets there. So we're looking at kind of weaving a different story for each of them. But overall, what you're saying before that bit can be the same for both of them. But then when we get down into the nitty gritty that we'll look at in a little bit, different types of information will be given to both of those. But thanks so much for sharing. Now let's think about those projects for the rest of the workshop. So now we need to think about what pictures we would likely use during the project. So as it says here, the average word count for a very successful crowdfunding campaign is only 300 to 500 words. And like I said, that is because the majority of the things that we're putting on the page should be imagery. Now, what is both good for you guys making games and also really annoying is that the quality of your crowdfunding page needs to be the same quality as the game. If you can't design a great crowdfunding page in terms of the aesthetics, people will think your game is going to have bad aesthetics. They're just going to make that connection. So what we need to make sure is whoever you've got on board to make the game beautiful, we need to get them on board to make the crowdfunding campaign and all the comms around it beautiful and on brand as well. So these are the types of photos that we need. So we need the product in action. Now, I understand you might not have the product ready yet, but whatever prototype or basic version you can make, have that in action and have your target market, your 18 to 30 male and female fantasy lovers playing it and showing that variety of people that are playing your game. We also need to show the product contents. So what contents is it going to come with? Is it going to come with dice? Is it going to come with cards? Is it going to come with figurines? Is it going to come with a, a deck, a board, whatever? We need to see what we're buying. You also need to have your stretch goals on there. So be ambitious. Your target might only be 10,000, but that doesn't mean you're going to stop funding if you get hit 11,000. So what can you do with 15? What can you do with 25? What could you do with 50? How are you growing on your project? You also, I mean, none of you have got your cameras on, so I'm guessing you maybe don't like being on camera, but you will need to have a photo of you and all the other creators that are part of the project on the page. The eye contact from people on your page really helps to build that connection and level of trust with the audience. We don't see it as much on gaming campaigns, but it's still there. Also be sure to have a timeline. If you've said that the campaign, the product is coming in two years time, what are some key highlights that you're going to, key milestones that you're going to be hitting from now for the next two years until that game gets in my house? Make it relatable. So if we're going to attract audiences from different countries or different ethnicities, 
try and make sure we've got some photos of those different ethnicities playing the game in order to make it look that it is relatable equally on a more simple level don't have all men playing the game if you actually want to attract women as well a lot of them will just think it's a game that's more for men show what rewards you have and obviously as i've said eye contact and make sure these pictures are high quality you have created a visual masterpiece with your game your campaign should reflect that so here's an example this campaign raised just over eight thousand dollars this is um, a Serbian campaign and at the end I'll share with you a video with the founder about their crowdfunding process and how they thought about it and everything. But as you can see over here we've got product in action and relatable hanging out with friends friends with different colored skin tones male and female friends looking like they're having fun. That is the product in action that is making it relatable to their target market of, let's say, Americans, English people, etc. Over the other side of the page, we've got the project contents. We're seeing that it comes with a little egg timer, different cards uh, of different types in a box that is yay big. We can also see from their page that they've got their stretch goals. Their first goal is 6,000. The next stretch goal was 10, third stretch goal 20,000, et cetera. I've just taken these pictures off their main campaign page. Rewards, it tells you there what you get for the different amounts of rewards going up all the way really to this $115 full deluxe game where there is a lot of information. As you can see, all of these are really on brand with their colors, with their design, et cetera. Got the creators here. Several of them are making eye contact. They're also kind of quite smiley if they're not making eye contact. Smiles and eye contact really bring that connection with you. And then you've got their timeline, where their time is going once the campaign has ended in terms of when they're starting to ship the product out, when it should be in your house. I'd say that's quite important for games like this, which are a bit more, let's say, like party focused or something. You might be wanting to buy it for a birthday party, Christmas party. You might be wanting to buy it for an occasion where you've got people coming over. So if you see that it's in your hands in July, it'd be pretty good present to give someone whose birthday is in like August or September. But it wouldn't be that great a present to give someone if their birthday is in like February, for example. So these are things to take into consideration when you're trying to get people to back your campaign. The most important thing is really to bring in other voices. Obviously, you think your campaign is amazing. You think your project is amazing. You think your game you've created is amazing. But we know that there are so many flops out there. What you need to do is show other people that other people think your game is amazing. So bring in reviews from gamers, bring in reviews from, um, from people more trusted than yourself, from supporters, from investors or grant bodies, from mentors, from influencers in the industry, but also just bring in testimonials from customers and people who have tried it and tested it before. Make sure that you've got a variety of other voices coming into the campaign. Does anyone have any questions about that in terms of the imagery that they want to be using for their project? If you've got any questions about it, obviously write it in the chat. The next thing that you want to think about after thinking about that project page and all of those, um, all of those photos and storytellings is really the crowd. So who is going to back your campaign and we have this excel spreadsheet that looks at how many people you need to back your campaign so again looking at your target looking at the average pledge 25 pounds how many people do you need to back the campaign if that number is nowhere near the number of people on your mailing list or your social media following for example you're not going to hit your your goal that number needs to be as high as possible 
before you launch because once you've gone live you just want to get money from the people you don't want to be like introducing yourselves and your business and trying to take them down your sales funnel so quick question there are two restaurants they both serve italian food you're taking some friends out for dinner which restaurant are you likely to go into a it's dead empty the waiters are giving you awkward looks or B, the one that's pretty busy, you might have to wait, but you can see a couple of tables spare. Throw it in the chat box, which of those you'd most likely go in. Eagles going B, Andrea still scared of COVID going A. So most people in this situation, although this definitely was a lot easier pre-COVID, would go B. They can trust it more. People are looking like they're having fun. You kind of know you're not gonna get food poisoning, Whereas the other one, you are a bit more wary about. Also in the other one, if, they, if you do go in there, they'll probably put you straight in the window to use you to entice other people to come in in general. And this psychology is really the same in a crowdfunding campaign. Same situation here. There are three crowdfunding campaigns. Imagine that your friend has just said, hey, I'm running a crowdfunding campaign. At which stage are you likely to give your money to? Which of these campaigns would you be likely to give your money to? In reality, if you don't know the campaign, but you think it's just a fun looking game that you're willing to take the chance on, you'd probably give money at the third level. If it is a friend, if you do know them and you do think their idea is quite good, then you'll probably give, level, give money when it's at level two. But if it's a friend and you're not quite sure, you might wait till level three. But when it's at level one, it is very unlikely that you will give money. You're thinking to yourself, why does this person not even give themselves $25, 25 euros? Why does this person's mom not even want to give them 25 euros? Why does this person's girlfriend, boyfriend, sister, brother, best friend not even support their game? If you can't convince your own close friends and family to be backing your project and trusting that you can make it happen, then it's very unlikely that other people are going to trust you. So what we really want to see is actually that other people trust you and people will trust you first and then the more removed people will start to believe. So for example, if I say, can I have 25 euros? If I gave you my bank details now, realistically, how many of you are gonna go and put 25 euros into my bank? You can put a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I think you've got that uh, feature. Or you can just put nothing and then I'll just feel as though I'm speaking to a blank wall and you're all just ignoring me. Now, realistically, that's probably the truth. None of you are going to give me 25 euros. We don't know each other. You have no need to. You've only been speaking for 40 minutes. You have no need to trust me. So if I said I've created a game, it's all about crowdfunding, et cetera, et cetera, you're not going to bother. But if we started this relationship, and I started chatting to you and you know you followed me on social media and I showed you good things that added some value to your life. And then you signed up to my mailing list and then I sent you some great videos that I thought were funny and some people also saying how great my game was, et cetera. Over time, you would start to trust me more. And over time, you would start to think, maybe I will give some money and get this game. It sounds pretty awesome. Other people are saying it's awesome. She's shown me photos that it looks good. I've got space for it in my house. It's not really huge, that sort of thing. And then you're more likely to get the money. So what we have to remember is, number one, like no one gives us money the first time we ask for it. Even you and your friends probably don't do it that often. You probably will forget and they might have to remind you or you have to remind yourself. So we always need to think about, we have to, really build connections with people before we start asking them for money. And with crowdfunding, that's no different. So we also, we look at money 
and we think we need money. But if we really want to raise like £50,000, we're going to need so many people to give us money. Because if everyone's only giving us £25, that number is going to be huge. So we also need to think more strategically. Yes, who is going to give us money? But also, who is going to give us contacts? Because if we know someone that works for, let's say, the British Gaming Association, and they can write about our campaign in their newsletter. And let's say their newsletter is a thousand people big, probably bigger, but that means that we've now just got 1,000 new people that could give us money. Whereas if we just asked that person for money for the campaign, we'd only asked one person. And crowdfunding is all about getting those numbers up. Yeah, Dushan, you want to add something? Unmute yourself, go for it. Hey, Jess. Hey. Amazing work. Thank you. But the thing is, the, I would like to call it here in Serbia. It's like you're going to, for a wedding and then you, you then you then you just invite your friends and family and everyone that you know. And you just don't you just tell them, like, just put the money in the envelope. Don't buy me like uh, some home appliances or something like that. Just put the money in the envelope and that will do the work. It's more or less the same. Also, I, uh, and uh, this is just to add to, to what you are talking about. Basically, it relates to the same thing. Uh, also, it's it's like impulsive purchase, you know. Just for these two days, you have this special uh, discount in these shopping malls. It's the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the only thing that I would like to add. Yeah, so the impulsive purchase works best when you've hit that 60, 65, 70% mark. Exactly. Because that's when people think like, I'm actually going to get it. Whereas when it's- early, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose it. Say again? I'm going to lose it. Yeah. So when we're looking at the- 65% upwards, then we can look at those impulsive purchases from people that we don't yet know, but we have to get to that point first. So we want to build that crowd up as big as possible to make sure we obviously hit the wide number of people. So who do we know that has contacts that we can uh, reach out to? Who do we also know that has expertise? Because obviously, like, as I've said, we need videographers, we need designers, we need illustrators, all of those things. Are we going to be paying for all of that or can we call in favors? Because however much we need to pay for all of those things, we then obviously need to like raise more overall. Also, we want to look at who has influence. So who has influence? Who do we know that's influential to our audience that can help us with this campaign? If they say this is the greatest game ever, then their audience is going to believe them. And again, it's going to make our life easier. And then who has passion? There's so many jobs with crowdfunding that are just time consuming. Sending out thank yous, keeping an eye on the databases, who, who needs following up again, who doesn't that sort of thing, content creation to some extent. If we have a lot of people with passion, then that also makes our campaign easier. We can then give some of the jobs to different people in order to do some of the more important jobs ourselves. And the same with time. Crowdfunding takes so much time. You're probably a game designer, you're a founder of your studio, something like that. You also probably have a life outside of work. If you want to still be able to do all of those other things, then you have to get great at the art of delegation for your crowdfunding campaign. So here we've just got some photos. The top photo is a photo of me and my mum. My mum could definitely back my crowdfunding campaign £25. If she wants to buy the game, great. If she doesn't, she would just give that money. Contacts. If 
will be much better. Can you hear me now? Yes, there was a slight uh, hiccup. Okay, cool. Um, so if there's if she worked for a company that had something to do with my industry and my gaming, then that would be really handy to use her as the gatekeeper into that network. Expertise, she's an accountant. So that's really handy for my campaign because obviously it's a lot to do with finance and juggling money and everything. If I can get her to help with that, it frees it up from my time and my efforts. Influence, she doesn't have much influence in the gaming industry, so that's not so great. Passion, yeah, she'd wanna see whether my project would succeed, so she'd be passionate to help out. Time, so-so, she's got some time. Underneath that, we've got a photo of my grandma. She absolutely hates that I use her in all of these workshops, but I find it quite amusing that she's now, she's been all across the Balkans without even knowing it. So if she ever went to like Belgrade, I like to think someone might come to, has come to my workshop and be like, oh my God, are you Jess's grand? And she'd be like, what? Anyway, cash. Yeah, she gives 25 pounds to a crowdfunding campaign. And for a grandma, she's actually pretty good with technology. So she'd put it in the crowdfunding campaign itself rather than just give me the money. Contacts, no relevant contacts in the gaming industry. Expertise, no relevant expertise in the gaming industry. Influence, not really. Passion, yeah, she'd want it to work. She would be telling all her old lady friends about it, not that any of them would probably understand what it was, but she would be really proud to be showing them what's happening. She'd probably get it up on her phone and keep showing them how that money is going up. And time, so long as Wimbledon's not on, she's retired, she's got plenty of time, but you cannot call her during the tennis. Underneath, we've got two of my friends, Kajal and Carlos. I'm not gonna ask them for money. They just got married and they have a new baby. They're probably feeling pretty tight with money. But Kajal works for a business network, let's say a similar thing to Swiss EP um, in London. She probably has some good contact that would come in handy for my campaign. Expertise, Carlos is a videographer. If I could get him to help me with the crowdfunding video, with any of the social media videos, with the editing, that would be really handy and obviously save me quite a lot of time myself and money. Influence, not so much. Passion, maybe. Carlos likes playing games, so we'd see whether it was a, a game that he actually was interested in. If it was, great. I might get some extra help. Time, no, they just had a baby and they work full time. So anything I ask them really needs to be done kind of in advance to make sure that we've got the best opportunity of utilizing their skills. So what I want you to think of now is who would you use in the campaign to help you hit your target? Who would you bring on board in terms of your cash, in terms of bringing you contact, in terms of expertise, influence, passion, and of course, in terms of time. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you like five minutes to fill this in as much as possible. But again, write it in the chat. Let me see how many people you're putting in for each of these sections. If you put one person in for each of the boxes for cash, then you've made like 200 pounds or euros. Now, obviously you want to raise more than that. So in reality, you'd want to be spending about half a day minimum on this activity. I understand it's like the end of the day, you're on a webinar, you're probably not going to want to spend the next hour on this activity. But really, I encourage you to spend like the next five minutes writing in each of the boxes, people's names that you think you could do. Family and friends make sense. Media. Who, who do you know that works in the media? Podcast, YouTube, TV, journalism, any kind of media. Who do you know that's influencers in your industry? In your industry, in if your game is like a fantasy game, who do you know who's influential just generally in fantasy space and in gaming space? If you're a sports game, football, who do you know who's influential in football? And who do you know who's influential in games? You've got two separate industries that you can take people from in this respect. 
any other local businesses that you think you could partner with in the area that you're working with, either like for merchandise or for illustrations or for spin-offs? Who is advising you on this? Do you have trustees? Do you have directors of the business? Do you have mentors? Any other people from Swiss EP or Serbian Games Association, et cetera? Social group leaders, this is looking more to like your hobbies. What do you do? And who are the gatekeepers of your social groups? Because chances are, if you do it, your friends are probably into something like this too, unless you have like a hidden double life. Um, and then interested groups, again, thinking about your target market. Who do you know in your interested groups? Who do you know that is an 18 to 30 year old fantasy lover that's a male or a female? And then colleagues, you know, who else is working on this with you? Because we need to be tapping into their networks as well. So I'll give you five minutes and then I want to know how many people you have for each of those different keys down the side. Any questions, unmute yourself, write it in the chat box. Okay, let's have a look. Starting from friend and going clockwise. So is this just for cash, Andrea? Or is this for like all of them? You can unmute yourself if you want, or you can type. Oh, he's got a microphone. It's getting fancy. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, this was mostly for cash. Yeah. Um, for contacts, I think it, it will be a similar number, maybe divided by, uh, by half. So half of the numbers I quoted. Um, expertise will probably only be two people. Mm -hmm. um, influence would again be two people because those two people are the influencers. So I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, passion would be uh, eight because those are the interested groups and the social group leaders. Yeah. Because... It also makes sense there in that type of thing. Um, and time would probably be um, eight divided by two because half of my friends and family would probably be more likely to do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is a really good start. The only thing I'd argue is you probably have more people in passion than you think. Like the advisors probably and the influencers might also be in passion. What you want to think about, though, and what you've done really well is looking at the different groups of people and also thinking that some people are 
more than one thing, which is great. Like people are going to be passionate and they are going to be cash. You know, it's not one person, one thing at a time. So you've gone off to a really great start there. I'll just give it a few more minutes to see if anyone else wants to share theirs before I head on. Another real benefit of doing this activity is also seeing where your gaps are. So for example, from Andrea, we can see like media is a bit of a gap and local businesses is a bit of a gap. So if, if he really wanted to like push on those ones, then he knows that from now until he wants to go run his campaign, he's going to go hang out with like all the podcasters, all the YouTubers and just like network with the journalists. If he thinks like, you know, eight is fine on family and friends, then he can kind of like let that slide a bit whilst going to work on the other ones. But what you start to work out in this situation is where those gaps are and where might need a bit more work. Okay, let's look at Igor's. We've got family and friends on average, at least 20 per team member, excluding the overlapping ones. That's great. Media, podcast, culture, magazines, influencers, few local business, a dozen advisors, that's good. Advisors always have great networks, right? So we can use those dozen to get even more in terms of their networks. Social group leaders, we don't have any on. Interested groups, a few colleagues, a dozen and counting. So basically like if Igor was going to set up his crowdfunding campaign, obviously he would be the first person to put money in to show that he believes in his game and also to just test the whole system works. Then all of his colleagues ideally would be putting in a few pounds, a few euros here and there. And then they would be shared. Only then would they start sharing it out with the friends and family. So then once the campaign already starts to go out, you've already got, let's say, 13 or, you know, to some extent, maybe 24 backers if everyone gets their partner to chip in as well. And then that way you never send out a campaign that has zero money from zero backers. That's like the worst first impression you could ever have. So this is good. He now sees where his spot, blind spots are. Great. So if we carry on then, as I've already said, <clears throat> you have like three tiers of networks. Your primary network, which are your contacts. In that respect, think about like your mobile phone contacts, your WhatsApp contacts, your Facebook friends that you've met in real life your friends, your colleagues, your people that know you. That's your primary network. As we can see here, your primary network is pretty much hoping to fund you up to 35%. Once you hit that 35%, your secondary network starts to come into its position. And that are the friends and family of all your contacts. So your best friends, mom and dad, brother and sister, your friends, friends that you don't yet know, the people who aren't that connected to you, they will really fund you at that 35 to 65%. And then those impulse buyers that uh, Dushan mentioned and the cold contacts and people that you haven't met yet, they start to give when you hit 65% funded. Another way to look at it from a business perspective is that your primary network are people who have already bought from you before, people who open up all your emails, who like and comment and share on your social media posts. They'll be your primary network. The secondary network will be the, uh, the social media following that only like occasionally, that don't really open your emails that often, and that know about you, but haven't bought from you yet. That'll be your secondary network. And then your tertiary network in this respect are like the social media stalkers that just lurk but never interact with you and the people still that don't even know that your business exists yet. Now, we need to start building that crowd as soon as possible. So really like from, you know, after this webinar, you've probably been building it before this webinar as well because it needs to be built to its strongest capacity before launch so that we have enough people in that primary network. 
from now until you launch your crowdfunding campaign, you can work on getting as many of your secondary network down into the primary network and as many as those social media lurkers from social media lurkery in the tertiary network down into your secondary network, bringing people down to make those bigger circles in the primary network stage is going to be really important. If you struggle to collect email addresses, followers, likes, etc., then you are 100% going to struggle to get money because that means that you don't know what content your audience likes, how your audience likes to be spoken to, and what they actually need to get them to part with their cash. Dragomir has added in his section from the previous task for influence, influencers in the media, for expertise, people with experience in the game industry, probably from one of the association or discord groups, for contact, interested groups and social leaders and advisors, passion, friends, family in the media, and cash, influencers, media, all other interested to help. Yeah, perfect, that makes, that makes sense. So when we know where the gaps are, we've then got to think, how can we fill them strategically? If our gap is in the media, we're not just gonna go to every networking event out there. We're really gonna focus our time on ones that are drawing in the media. So you need to find out who you want to interact it with, where they hang out, which team member is most suited to connect with them. Like, is that you? Or is there a team member in your group that's more charismatic? or that has more in common with this audience, so therefore would be a better connector. And then you've really just got to get out there and connect and engage and get out there either in the real sense of the term or online, but get them knowing who you are. Get them to know who you are early and get them to know what you're into uh, as soon as possible so that when the ask comes for whatever it is you're asking for, it's not out of the blue build that relationship before the ask and share your project ideas with them, get their feedback along the route as well. So who is gonna back your campaign? Earlier, someone said 18 to 30 male slash female fantasy lovers, but that is a huge group. We need to really like narrow that down. Equally, someone said like hardcore gamers and casual gamers. In my opinion, two different groups, Again, we need to hone that down. So what is the name of this person? How old are they? Where are they living? What is their job? What is their current backing habits? Like 18 to 30 fantasy lovers, male and female, great. But that can go even smaller because they've got to know what crowdfunding is. They've got to know how to back on Kickstarter. So actually our group is getting smaller. Then we need to make sure that they've got enough income to be willing to give money on. Kickstarter, so they might have these types of jobs. Then we need to make sure that they live in countries that know what crowdfunding is or back crowdfunding campaigns. So then they need to be in these particular countries or cities within those countries, probably more likely to back crowdfunding campaigns than people in villages. Again, very vague, but really honing it down as much as possible to really figure out who this person is. If they're a casual gamer, are they like in Discord groups as much as hardcore gamers or as a casual gamer, are they getting their information about new games and stuff from other places? We need to know this for the different audiences as, as detailed as possible so that we make sure that we're actually talking to that person. So obviously there are millions of social media groups out there, Facebook, Discord, got YouTube channels, everything, you know it better than me, looking in those places to find whether or not your target audiences are there. What I will say is obviously just because you like the channel doesn't mean your target market is on that channel. So for example, like Instagram, I do these workshops and everyone's like, oh, I'm just gonna go on Instagram and find all these people. And then I'm like, your target demographic are really not on Instagram. Like, let's say, for example, middle-aged males, really not on Instagram. So why would we be going on Instagram so much to be putting all of that stuff there? Really always think of your target market. 
You can use Google Alerts. If you don't already use Google Alerts, I really recommend you do, even if you're not going to be crowdfunding. It's great for PR. It's great for figuring out more about your target markets. So you create an alert. This was for a meditation campaign that I was running for like an app. And basically then every new news article, every new blog post that came up with those keywords on Google, I would get an email about. I can then make a spreadsheet where I'm following the journalist on LinkedIn, following them on Twitter, and the same with the outlet. And therefore, when I come to write my press release about meditation, app, whatever, I've got a whole list of journalists and outlets that I know I'm likely to publish it because they've published things before. I can stroke their ego and say how great that one I read in like February last year was by them. And obviously, I'm messaging the right person. This way, I have like the highest chance of seeing a return on my investment, with my investment being my time and effort. And I've got highest return on it because I'm sending it out to people who actually write about this stuff. So that's a really good habit to get into. Start building that now and you can use it for anything. A new release, an event, you know, whatever, a new piece of funding you've secured, crowdfunding, all of those things. In general, though, people will give your crowdfunding campaign eight seconds to decide whether or not they want to give money and find out, find out more and give money or whether they want to go back to, I don't know, watching cat videos on YouTube or whatever. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to give you eight seconds to judge a crowdfunding campaign by the first bit that you would see on the page. And then I want you to just put a letter Y for yes, if you would consider giving them money, or a letter no, well, a letter N for no, if you would be like, mm, no, not interested. And then let's see what it is we like about each of the campaigns. So ready for the first one? Here's eight seconds. Okay, so we, we give them money, yes, or not give them money, no. What are you thinking? Let's see some letters in the chat box. Okay, we've got two no's, so we've got three no's so far, four no's so far. You guys really don't like wombats, hey? Okay, so who wants to unmute themselves and just tell me like, why? Why are you not into this campaign? What is it you don't like? Other than the fact that none of you like wombats. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so basically first I was drawn in by the reds and then I wasn't sure what those square blocks are. And then mm -hmm. I was looking at the hands and then I figured out it was some sort of uh, hand movement type of game. But I figured out I could easily recreate this game probably at home. So that was one of the reasons I said no, because I feel like even if, I, if, it, if it doesn't get it funded, I can make it at home. Fair. Yeah, that makes sense. Dragomir says you can't see the product. I'm concerned that you can see the product. And that's maybe all it is. There's also not much wombat going on there, but okay. Um, anyone would want to know more? Feel free to write it in the chat or unmute yourself. Do, yeah, explain. <laughs> well, like I said, uh... I think I could recreate it at home. I would be intrigued to see if I wanted to do it. And then mm. maybe I would try to do it. And if I don't like the end result, then maybe I would consider funding it if I feel like they would bring a uh, better quality product, so to speak. Yeah, that makes sense. I think also, you know, the fact they've raised so much money, I think that would make me intrigued to look down the page to think, okay, like everyone loves this. Why don't I love this? Um, 11 and a half thousand backers and it also says it's from the you know the makers of exploding kittens so I might trust it with a little bit more and think okay I've heard great things about that game 
let me go and find out a bit more about this one. Okay, ready for the next one. I'm just going to put some space in the feedback. Igor would have played the video first, never back without research. Yeah, of course, please don't do that. Um, but let's have a look at the next one. What do we think about this one? I'll give you eight seconds. I want to see a Y or an N in the chat box. He doesn't like wombats, but he likes cats. This is what we've learned today. I would say I like Cthulhu. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> okay, so what do you like about this one then? Talk us uh, through your decisions. Well, firstly, uh, the main image of like the green Cthulhu, I feel like I've seen it somewhere. So I have like some sort of um, product relationship, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing, uh, compared to the Wombat game, I feel like card games are uh, harder to reproduce. I feel like a lot of the charm come, comes from the, the cards itself, like the artwork. Um, so I would be interested. Then again, I would have some uh, sort of, uh, how to say, thought because it isn't pledged. But then again, this is Kickstarter, so usually it means my money won't be pulled if the project isn't funded, so I'm not really risking much. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really key thing that you've mentioned there as well. There's like 28 minutes to go, and they need to get like another 10 grand. So definitely that's going to make you think, you know, I could spend the next few minutes or whatever looking at this and putting my bank details in, or like, I could go grab a drink or something like that. I could answer that email. Because there's only 28 minutes left, like that's going to really work against you in this res respect from like thinking more about it. Whereas if there was 28 days to go, then definitely if you're interested, you would spend a little bit more time to think about it. Igor mentions, yeah, same thing there. Dragomir says it's not his, not his type uh, of game. He doesn't have more information about the game. Yeah, you'd want to then scroll down to see whether you're going to get those answers uh, answered later on. Okay, next one. Here we go. Eight seconds. What do we think about this one? A yes or a no in the chat box. Definitely the most speedy person on here today, Andrew. Now, an interesting thing about this one is there are like 21,000 and their target is 25,000. This being a Kickstarter means they need to hit all of their funding if they go, if they want it. So if it closed now, they've got 703 backers, but actually they get zero money. And like Andrea said, those 703 backers, the money would never leave their bank account. It only leaves at the end if they hit their target. Right now, I would say in this situation, this crowdfunding campaign creator is absolutely like scared. <laughs> are they going to hit their target? They've got five day, five hours left and they are like four grand off their target. That is a scary situation to be in when they've obviously put in so much hard work to get 703 backers. But what I will say to you, because there's a potential you might be in this situation one day, is it is very, very, very possible that you do hit your target. The last three days, as it said earlier, uh, money just keeps coming back in. And really those last 24 hours, I've seen more than like 20 grand pledged in the last day. So, you know, four grand in five hours, it is possible because you always get the world's most annoying people in your mind 
who give money at the last minute. So always never give up before the campaign has actually ended. There might be a situation like this where you're like, it's four grand, I'm never going to make it. Because at this point, you're probably really tired, really tired of crowdfunding, thinking you've exhausted all of your networks entirely. But trust me, there's a 100% possibility that you will be hitting your target. It's not a ridiculous idea that you can get that four grand in five hours. Dragomore says yes to support fellow indie developments. And Eagle also says yes, probably to backing that campaign. See, look, we're already 50 euros closer to the target if they backed it in five hours left to go. Okay, let's look at the next one. What about this one? Is this a yes, would want to find out more, or a no, not interested? Going back to look at cat videos on YouTube. Maybe later, not now. So my thing with this one is it just really doesn't come across that it's very like professional. It's Charlie Cross, it's a photo of him. It's not a studio. It's not a brand name. It's not, it's not even a very well-developed page in the aesthetics. It looks very like 1990s. Uh, the colors, they're looking a bit like Uno, but again, it's not that well-designed. Like Andrea said, I'd be thinking, could I kind of make this myself? It doesn't look like it's that hard. And where is the trust from this bit right now? I don't get any trust. It's got two backers, but it also says a coal miner and a doctor develop an original card game. Well, there's your two backers. Didn't really think anyone else has backed it, do we? Um, they've given 33 pounds between them. So I'm probably not going to give much if I'm not going to give more than they're going to give at this stage. So there's a lot working against this right now. Also, the fact it's a flexible goal. Does this mean that I'm a bit more wary of it? They're going to get their 33 pounds. If I take them up to 40 pounds, am I actually going to get my product? Can they really make the game for 40 pounds? Or what are they going to do with that money? Because maybe their production run actually costs 2000 pounds. So that's something to really think about. If you do a flexi funding, it's making sure people know what you're gonna do with that money if it looks like you're not hitting your target. Okay, so as we already said, the trust is a huge element. We want testimonials, we want case studies, we wanna see your press coverage and any partnerships. And again, in a variety of ways, we don't all love watching videos, we don't all love reading stuff. So have some text, have some videos. Also, where possible, have your press coverage, but make it look a whole lot sexier than this boring list of hyperlinks down the side, which I found on someone's Kickstarter page. We don't need the links to all of those on the page. You can just use the logos. So use the logos of that podcast show. Use the logos of the law mistress, use those logos, but then just use the actual articles as your funnel to get them onto the page. So share each of those in a different social media post. And look, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine pieces of content already. Each of those different days taking you to the crowdfunding page. When we talk about that funnel to take people to the crowdfunding campaign, we've got to think, how are they getting there? No one wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to go find a random game I've never heard of and give them my money. But if you are that person, then like send me your email address because I've got loads of campaigns that you'd love. But in reality, we all need to be guided to that page. So where are the people hanging out and where are you getting them to guide them? It's like getting the net and then obviously honing it down. 
to email, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, press, offline events, guerrilla marketing. You want to be using the biggest combination of all of these so that you can really target people in all their surroundings so that they really think, wow, this campaign is everywhere. And for the right person, it will be everywhere. And for like the wrong person, they'll have never seen it, never heard of it because they're not in any of those groups. They don't read those magazines, but that's fine. They weren't the target market anyway. So the funnel, we've got the awareness at the top. We need more people to be aware of it. We need loads of people to be aware of it. Then we've got the engagement. 100 people might be aware that we're crowdfunding. Only maybe 50 people will actually click on it to check it out further. And then obviously out of those 50, maybe two go on to give us money. So at every stage, we lose people. So the awareness is all about before the launch and in the early days. It's like coming soon, project details, the what, the where, the who, the why, the when, the how. Underneath that, we've got the engagement. And that is all, you know, sign up to get exclusive discounts, like this post, share this, tag a friend who would be interested in joining you on this quest, things like that. Then we can start to see who is really the most excited about this. And therefore, out of those people, we can then really understand how many are likely to back the project. As you can see, we've just shared some, some statistics with you. Only 12% of Facebook friends actually see your posts. 12% of Facebook shares turn into a pledge. A Facebook timeline post has only a 4% chance of turning into a pledge. Emails are the best for crowdfunding. An email that is shared has a 53% chance of turning into a pledge, but the average email conversion rate is 25% anyway. So here's an example. Do you guys know this company? They're based in Macedonia and they have done so many board game crowdfunding campaigns. Well, I'll look at them in a bit more detail a bit later. But this is one of their games that they did. They raised $370,000, 4,611 backers. And this was their game, The Rise for Nobility. This was back in like 2017, this one. But anyway, here's an example of their awareness post. So their campaign hadn't even gone live yet. It was going live in like April. And this is just a picture from the game. A picture from the game. You can see the theme there. And it says clearing up the city for the grand opening, nine days to go. So nine days until their crowdfunding campaign goes live. They're making you aware that that is happening. And they're showing you what type of like vibe the game has. As we can see, we've got 18 likes and two shares, but it's an awareness post. We weren't looking for likes and shares. We we're just getting people to be aware. Then we go on to engagement post. Rise to Nobility comes to Kickstarter on April 5th. So it's again, a bit of awareness there. Subscribe to our newsletter at finalfrontiergames.com to be notified the minute we launch. That's the engagement. They want you to sign up. This post, much higher number of likes, much higher number of shares and comments. Remember as well, it's super easy to do a like. You literally just click one button. It's harder to write a comment because you've got to put loads of buttons and loads of text. And then a share, it's pretty easy, but it's harder than a like because now you're associating it with your ego, with your network. So we're always going to be seeing highest number of likes and then shares and then comments. Then, as we can see here, the campaign is live, 24 hours of the campaign, a thousand backers already, eight stretch goals unlocked, and there's the link to the crowdfunding campaign. So this is a pledge post. This is come back the campaign now. As you can see, the number of likes and shares, et cetera, has gone downhill because that's not what they want. They want the money at that point. So these are the three key posts, the awareness posts, the engagement posts, and then the pledge posts. And when you look at your bigger marketing plan for your crowdfunding campaign, that is how yours should be looking as well. So content doesn't last long. I think we all know that. Um, so again, we've got to think about how much content do we need to create to keep this in people's minds? 
We don't want to overload them. So it's not like we need a Facebook post every five hours of the 24 hour day, every day of the campaign, but we need enough to keep people aware. One thing I will say again is so many people think oh, I've talked about my campaign too many times. No money's come in. No one's backing my campaign. Everything's going wrong. And then I ask them like, well, when did you last tell people you were crowdfunding? When did you last send an email or do a social media post? And it'd be like, uh, like a week. And I'm like, cool, 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 cool. Do you remember the social media post you saw last week, Tuesday at 5.26 p.m.? Like, no. So why would they? You cannot really overload people with content really in this day and age. So don't worry so much about creating more content and having more content and being able to choose from more content based on what has been working is a much safer position to be in than like having to reuse content and then bore your audience. So how many posts do I need? How long is a piece of string? It really depends. In an ideal world with a good quality posting, you'd wanna have about 10 emails. So it's kind of like three or four before launch about the campaign, and then like one a week during the campaign, plus a few extra when you really smash a milestone, when you get the most amazing testimonial or the most amazing piece of like press coverage. Around 80 Facebook posts or whichever platform you're using that requires a kind of like daily feed, um, and then 170 kind of Twitter posts because they are really kind of constant, more three times a day, that sort of thing. And you want to have about two press releases, one at the beginning. It's launched. It's all this exciting. You finally unveiled what you've been working on. And then once in the middle of the campaign, maybe more of a, a bio on you as the creator or again on some amazing collaboration or some story that has come up from the campaign itself. So there's loads of different content types that work well. Uh, these are just some examples, but also again, looking at your own social media, what you currently do, what content you currently put out and look at the data. What works well, what doesn't work well? I'm telling you like these ones work well, statistics work well, behind the scenes work well. But if you've already tried that and they've absolutely bombed, then like don't copy what I'm saying. But have a think about, are there any statistics or behind the scenes information or photos that you could put out to your audience? So a statistic could be something along the lines of like, how many man hours went into creating the game? Or um, how many percentage of the world is a fantasy lover? Or how much fantasy lover, how many like fantasy games came out last year? Something like that, that could be a statistic. And that's really like an awareness post. And then behind the scenes could just be photos, videos of you guys in your offices or homes making the games, making the early editions and seeing how that has come on to where it is now. All of those sorts of things, even just drinking some coffee and being like, it's been a long night, it's 3 a.m. and I'm having another coffee, like whatever, it's my seventh coffee today. Um, People want those type of human interest pieces and stories when they're thinking about backing the game, because it's also those things that make the game more attractive rather than just going for like a big gaming company. So here's an example again from the Final Frontier Games. They're releasing a new game. And on the website, they've got it and enter your email address. Sign up to receive updates and insights of the project development. Does your website have somewhere where people can sign up to receive this information? Can they get some discount off when the campaign goes live? Can they get a free download, something like that, that they're going to want? You know, make sure you've got somewhere that you're capturing their email addresses. Really work hard to be building up the posts, have a landing page, either on Kickstarter or on your website, signing up, pushing that out there. If we are putting content out there now that's not working to build up the email addresses, as I said earlier, it's not gonna work to build the money coming in. We've gotta use this as a test. 
everything has to link to your crowdfunding campaign, your personal social media profiles, your business pro social media profiles, all the kind of like headers, footers, all of that thing. And really importantly, put the dates on there. We need the dates of the launch and the end of the campaign to be like seared into people's minds so that they know, oh, it's that day that's been like said so much. I know what day that is. Or, oh no, I've only got two more days till I have to give money to that campaign if I want to be a part of it. We don't want people to be like, can I give you money to that campaign now? And then you'd be like, uh, that ended yesterday. Like that would be the worst situation. So this is a, an organization that is not game related, it's food related, but they did so badly at promoting their campaign. As you can see from this food related campaign, it was everywhere. It was on their social media and on their founders' social media. Whereas this one, they didn't once put the link to their crowdfunding campaign on their Instagram. It just went straight to their website, didn't even say they were crowdfunding. On their Facebook, it did not say they were crowdfunding. It did not have any posts about crowdfunding, but you can see there is a link there to a crowdfunding campaign. That one was not the crowdfunding campaign that was currently live. That one was an old one that was closed on a different platform completely. So that was ridiculous. And then they put links to their um, Twitter account, which didn't even exist. So none of this makes me think that they're actually crowdfunding. Whereas everything here makes me think these guys are crowdfunding. So you really want to think, you know, you've got to really hone it into people's minds and make it as easy as possible for them to give. This is just another silly example, really. But this organization created an event for the launch of their campaign. This was a really good idea because, again, it got you seeing how many of your audience were actually interested to come. So can you create an online event for your game, a little test demo, a little gameplay, a little Q&A, whatever, to get people to sign up for free to know that they're coming to that event, to then know how many people are likely to give on day one? Really handy tip. However, a few days later, they really messed it up and they just put this thing on that says our promo video is ready and we've posted an out outtake to whet your appetite like this post if you'd like to see more outtakes, but they didn't actually put the outtake there. So I'm not really gonna go and search and try and find that outtake. It would be much better if they just put that text with the outtake so I could enjoy it at that time. So that's something to really make sure that you do. Yes, you may do one great post, but you may just mess it up in a few days. Chances are if they only see the one in a few days, it's not gonna work as well. Then it comes to importance with all the words that we're using for the crowdfunding campaign. There are certain words which get people to open emails and do things. And there are certain words which really get them not to open up and do things. So words such like donate really stops people from wanting to open emails. So don't ever be putting the words in white in your subject headings because it's going to be working against you. Use the words in yellow to really make sure people are opening your emails. So then once you've done all this communicating, you've created all the content, you're then ready to go live. And like I said, you get most money in the first week and the last week. As you can see here, week three really takes a downer. It's not new and exciting anymore, and it's not an urgency to give. So the number of pledges coming in during that time is really going to be low. You need to mentally prepare for that because week three is going to make you feel like absolute rubbish. The first week, you're getting all of these dopamine hits. Ting, ting, ting. Money's coming in. All these people are backing your campaign. You've never heard of them. It's going well. You're getting invited to like do interviews you're really feeling quite like a celebrity. Week two, you start continuing riding on that high, but you start to get tired. Things start to like slow down a little bit, but you're quite glad of that because you're absolutely exhausted by this point. Then the third week comes and it all just drops off. 
You might get days that go on without having any backers. You might get no one's replying to your emails, but they replied in the first week and now they've kind of stopped replying. Seriously, this can take a toll on your mental health. You, in, in my opinion, the dopamine hits from the first week are strong enough to cause already like a level up in your addiction of getting those dopamine hits. So then when week, week three comes, chances are in week three, you're still getting like more attention than pre-crowdfunding, but your level of base has changed and you're going to start feeling the toll. Why is no one backing? Why is no one replying? Tiredness is really kicking in as well. You're spending so long doing things that don't seem to be working. But just know that this is the trajectory. Everyone goes through this. When week four comes, you're still feeling really tired, but things start to pick up slightly. And then by week five, you're absolutely exhausted. You've wondered why the hell you've done all this. But in that last week, the last five hours, potentially, you raise that four grand and you're starting to feel like week one again with all those dopamine hits coming back. It's re really important to remember this during the campaign because some people, some people will call me during their campaign, like not even my clients, and they want some extra help because it's not going very well because they're in week three and they want to quit. And I'm like, whoa, hold off. Don't press the button just yet. Carry on. This is the trajectory. Look at these pictures with the emojis. Look at the financial graph there. Don't quit just yet. And then their campaign goes on to succeed. And it can, it's so possible for turning around once you're in the week three mark. So we have these calendars that give a tip every day of the campaign as well. You're more than welcome if you want one of them. It just helps you to keep a different marketing idea, keep fresh ideas coming up throughout the length of the campaign. And we also have crowdfunding Q&As where you can come ask any questions about the crowdfunding experience. They're every Tuesday from four till five GMT. And different people will be in each one and they're all at different stages. So you'll always get someone in week three that's really just wants to rant for the hour. And you'll get someone in week four or five that's like, don't worry, mate, it's going to get better. And they're like, oh, OK. And then they come the next week and they're like, oh, my God, it got better. This is such a shock. And we're like, no, it's not like we told you that was going to happen. Don't worry. Always keep an eye on where your money is coming from. So use the data. Where's the money coming from? If it's coming from this place, keep putting content there. If it's not, stop putting content there. If your videos really aren't doing well, stop making videos. If blog posts are doing great, keep making more of them. Know where your money is coming from each week so that you can keep an eye on where to focus your efforts. Here are just some of the lessons learned. So like I always ask clients, you know, what do you wish you knew before you started this crowdfunding process? And so these are just some of the ones that people have said they wish they knew before they started the process. So I always put them in my workshops to hopefully help out others. Just take a read there. Money only came in when I asked outright is a real key thing. You can't be beating around the bush with your questions. Uh, British people especially are notorious for that. And it's like, just straight up ask what you want. And hopefully the other person will be like, yeah, sure, um, and do it. So once the campaign has ended, then you need to, you know, A, celebrate you got all your money, B, go take a really long nap or a well-deserved break. But after that, the follow up is important. You put in all that hard work and effort. We want to use and make sure that that group of backers give again to the next game, give again to the next game. They, we want to keep them loyal supporters with you. So export your backer list, set them up as a new mailing list and use the platform to update them as well. Every two to three months, or when there's something key in the development process, you want to let them know about it. So 
until they get the game, making sure they didn't just think, I gave them money and I never heard from them again. Make sure they're like, oh, an email from them. They've now like, you know, sent it off for the print run. So I should be getting it in the next few months, that sort of thing. On the platform, you can do updates. I suggest you do them during the campaign as well, but especially as the campaign has ended to let people know. This one, for example, is to let people know that all the orders have been fulfilled. Merry Christmas. Despite having a few setbacks during shipping, we've now sent all of the products off. That's really great. And this one was just done in an email on like MailChimp or whatever CRM system you use. Make sure that you make it personal and thank them a lot, but also mention some struggles as well as the excitement and the intrigue. People love the combination. Once you've finished your crowdfunding campaign, you've delivered your project, your game has been sent out to the world and everyone's loving it, you wanna wait at least like six months until you crowdfund again. Give people a break, give yourself a break and make sure that you know, take in the data and the experience from that first campaign into your subsequent campaigns. You wanna take all the learnings. So just like uh, Andrea did his Indiegogo as a trial campaign to see how it works. We want to take our learnings. What would we do the same next time? What would we do differently? The latest you want to launch a campaign every year is the second week of November because otherwise it just runs too close into Christmas. So if you do want to do two campaigns a year, they'll probably be like March and November. But otherwise, just do one, but make sure that you never launch later than that second week of November. Use your success in other forms of finance funding. Use your screenshot of how well you did in future pitch decks for investors. Use it in grant applications. You know, plaster that you were successful on Kickstarter on your website to get your general sales. Wherever it is, a successful crowdfunding campaign helps in the future for funding and finance. So here's an example. This is the Final Frontier Games. They launch all their products through crowdfunding now that they've really mastered how to do it. So we can see here, May 2016, their first campaign, they raised $107,000 from nearly 2,000 backers. <coughs> In April 2017, they ran their second campaign. They raised even more money from even more backers. In March 2018, they launched their next game, even more money from even more backers. October 2017, another game was launched. They then had a bit of a break. They launched again, March 2019. That year, they were so crazy, they did two in one year, in March and in September. They then waited a year, did one in 2020 in September, and another one in April 21. So as you can see here, even through the COVID times, they were still doing really well with their crowdfunding. And from April 2021, they went and did another one later on that year, which was the last one that they did now, which was October 2021, where again, they raised over $276,000 from three and a half thousand backers. Once you've got the recipe to succeed with crowdfunding, you may as well, and you can launch more and more and more campaigns because your audience isn't changing that much. Your games, ideas, your business is not changing that much. You've got it down to a T. So now I just want you to think about some things. So what are you taking away from this session? What one liner do you have to explain what crowdfunding is? If your friend asks you, hey, what's crowdfunding? What has surprised you most about the crowdfunding process that you perhaps didn't think we would talk about today? What do you think is gonna be your biggest struggle with crowdfunding? What do you think will be easier than you thought? And also like, what do you wanna go and focus on now after this session? So I'm gonna leave this time now for you to like write those answers in the chat box and hopefully share some of them with me. If you have any questions, then now is really a great time, unmute yourself whilst everyone else is writing and feel free and answer those questions. 
And then one last thing is obviously that's my email address. So feel free to email me if you have any questions about crowdfunding that you don't want to discuss today. Also, um, I have some like hours and time that I can give you to talk more about your project in particular. So email me and we'll set up a call about that. And I also have a, a YouTube channel where I have crowdfunding conversations with people about their crowdfunding campaigns and kind of the ins and outs of it all. And Kerber Games, Dusan from Kerber Games in Belgrade, Serbia um, has been featured and I'll be releasing his video in the next week or so. So I suggest going to look at that one again to see Serbian board game situation and how he crowdfunded. But otherwise, um, please answer those questions in the chat box and I'll hand it back to uh, Serbian Game Association. Thanks a lot, Jess. It's been really amazing uh, time, amazing uh, insights. Uh, so I'm gonna leave a minute or two. So let's see if, if there are any questions uh, at this point before we move on with the program. So I would invite anybody who wants to strike a question to, to, to turn on the camera and unmute. Maybe that's the, the best way. Uh, of course, uh, thanks for mentioning. So uh, Jess has been um, part of the game uh, funding bootcamp program uh, through the collaboration with the Swiss Entrepreneurial Program. So as she mentioned, uh, she also has some um, hours uh, covered to potentially provide some one-on-one -on -one, uh, support to any of you guys. Uh, so she's going to either leave an email or maybe I can follow it up uh, with all of you. And if you want to kind of uh, pick up the conversation specifically about your project, uh, you can do that um, in the in the coming days or weeks uh, directly with Jess. Is that right, Jess? Yeah. Okay. And I'll just put my email address in the chat box for people to copy as well. Okay, great. So... Uh, as you had some communication during an um, opportunity to ask questions also during the, the session. So I would actually, um, ah, okay, we have something. Okay, uh, doesn't seem as a question. <laughs> oh no, these are, I guess these are the takeaways. Ah, okay, sorry. So, so yeah. week three is the biggest surprise about the crowdfunding process. Yeah, that comes to everyone, which is why I, spend so much time to reinforce that it's going to happen like honestly like write a post-it note and put it the other side of your laptop so that you know like don't be scared of week three for when that happens and I'm super glad that you think that easier than you thought is showing off work and you're going to go and set up your newsletter that's great uh, Dragon Mir says his biggest struggle is to plan it yeah definitely the hardest thing now easier to do the plan since I've learned how crowdfunding grows. Thank you very much. And focus on making the project. Yeah. And by all means, yeah, get in touch with me and we can talk you through the planning, the timeline and any of those things. Okay, great. So uh, we have some, let's say, 30 to 40 minutes um, uh, left. So at, at this point, um, I would like to invite uh, Ivan Rajkovic from uh, the Forest of Radgos project to, uh, to, to join us. So we could have a, a short chat about uh, their project and their highly successful uh, Kickstarter campaign. Um, Ivan, are you with us? I see you. Uh, okay. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Are you okay with continuing in English? Because I think Jess might be uh, speaking. No problem at all. Okay, if uh, others are okay, I'm okay too. Great. So thanks a lot for uh, for setting uh, a, a bit of time uh, for us. So uh, in the dis description of today's workshops uh, workshop, we also kind of um, added information um, uh, about your project that we managed to also kind of last minute to, to be able to share your experience. I think uh, people in Serbia are also aware uh, of your project very much. On one hand, those who follow the crowdfunding and the board game 
um, uh, well, we could even say local board game industry. Um, and then you also shared a lot of your insights through um, interviewing the local Netocratia, uh, Netocratia uh, portal. Uh, so at this point, maybe I would ask you uh, how long has it been since you funded the campaign and how has the period after finishing the campaign in such a, with such a big success, how did it look like for you? Was it like um, uh, too much, let's say, burden to have so many backers and to deal with uh, so much production that, as I understand, you are still uh, involved in? Yes, thank you. Well, uh, first, it's almost a year and uh, one month since we launched the campaign and um, about one year since successful finish of campaign. And uh, we didn't uh, expect uh, uh, anything from, from a campaign in terms of how many bakers it, it, it will be there. So basically we didn't uh, get that impression uh, of uh, burden because there, there is very big support and very positive vibration. So you don't have that kind of, uh, of burden. Maybe the, the burden will be if uh, the number is 10,000 or something like that, because then it goes to different ball game totally. So basically this is still, let's say, successful for our, for our first uh, Kickstarter, it's more than successful, but in the terms of what Kickstarter can do, this is okay. This is some middle level ground and it's still manageable. I think it's even better that we didn't go over 10,000 of bakers in first campaign because you don't know so many things and it's very dangerous for you. Uh, and uh, uh, these last few years were very interesting in terms that you can be pretty much hit by the things that never happened. So basically you had the COVID and you have a five time shipping increase. So basically even the successful Kickstarter become unsuccessful because of that, because you get the money, but you ask for shipping early and then you're in the problem because shipping has gone from few thousand to 20,000. So basically it's not uh, easy at all after the Kickstarter, but let's say that we are okay and we are more or less uh, surprisingly good with the timeline. If you take in account that is the first time that we organize something like this. Okay, great. And could you tell me, did you already have like a precise production plan even before finishing the campaign in terms of uh, who will your vendors be uh, for the, you know, the printers and so on and so on? And um, as you are kind of, um, people might not know, but this is kind of a, your personal family initiative a project that is kind of a labor of love between you know, your son and you and your wife and so on. And as I understand, and a lot of friends. So did you in the meantime kind of get to know the professional board game industry? Uh, I know from David from Kerber Games that they were attending this very famous fair uh, in Germany for the final challenge game and kind of got to know about distributors, producers and so on and so on. So was this something you were familiar with uh, when you made the campaign or you went into that world after the success? Uh, one of the uh, main challenges, both for any, any part of project life, so basically from ma making game, from uh, making a Kickstarter campaign and marketing and everything, uh, from making production, is to find the right measure, to know enough, but not to go too much in details before it's right time. So basically, if you go too much in details, you will get tied up and you will not uh, manage to do marketing and you will not manage to, but if you go blind to the marketing, you will be very, you can be, doesn't mean that you will be, but you can be very hurt after that because you had made a lot bad projection for how much does thing cost or is it even doable? So basically what we had done, we make sure that all components and everything we do is uh, something that can be made. And we had, game in the stage that was play tested, polished and everything. So we were very, very sure in what we are offering, but we didn't go to the details how and who will make it and how much 
it will go to the latest detail because uh, you, you can get some quotes, but you will never get the final quotes because it will be a lot of time before you can finally say, yes, that's the material, that's the type, the size and everything. And all those can change in between because some paper goes uh, high in the price or components and nobody will give you a quote that will last for six months. So basically uh, you have to choose the right amount of uh, knowledge that you need in each step. Okay, maybe one more question for from me, and then I would I would pass it to to our uh, participants. So a bit about the preparation of the campaign, uh, because your game itself and the campaign, my personal impression is that it is also pretty, let's say, complex, and you had a lot of uh, different uh, rewards and so on. Uh, so uh, one question would be. Uh, how long did you work on the campaign um, and, you know, the preparation, production and execution? And did it uh, completely stay kind of a, a project between, you know, friends or you hired, let's say, anybody on a purely professional uh, basis, you know, experts for one uh, aspect of, of preparing this? Well, uh, let's say uh, like this, it took six months of uh, pre-launch pre campaign uh, for us, uh, which was going, uh, uh, let's say, in some uh, low burning sp uh, pace and then heating up as we going over the, 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 the campaign. And uh, uh, we had hired some, uh, we can say, friend of ours, but he's expert in marketing, not strictly in the Kickstarter and crowdfunding, but uh, at least he had the technical knowledge about the Google Analytics and so on and so on. That was absolutely needed because you cannot handle everything but yourself. The second stuff is that your listeners already do because they listen to Jess and the second stuff is to get insight from the people that are, let's say, a long, long term in that business because you maybe cannot get the real recipe because every project is, it has its own uh, crowd and everything, but you can at least learn not to make the stupid mistakes. So basically uh, you can uh, avoid stupid mistakes, avoid some, so basically it is always good to find and at least pay consultancy if you cannot afford for yourself a marketing expert who will work with you in parallel. We had paid for consultancy. We didn't have so much funds for marketing. So basically that was one of the reasons why we had to manage but uh, as I said, to have somebody like Jess or someone else who, who is that uh, line of business, it's most helpful. On another hand, what is uh, what was surprising for me because this is from someone who uh, entered and went through the campaign, and I sp spoke with a lot of people from Serbia here, uh, and the, the the usual how can I say error that we made here is that we think that we can get through all those marketing without funds, which is pretty much impossible. So you have to have money for marketing. And your material from game, as Jess said, it's good to recycle, but you will find a lot of stuff that you cannot recycle and you will have to make. So basically you have to plan, plan for uh, material for marketing also. So there is a lot of, and you will never, as, as just mentioned, you will never know what will bring the crowd. So you have to, to have wide funnel and see from where it goes and how it goes down. And one very important thing, uh, like I said, for shipping, let's say for marketing, in the time that we started, our best uh, platform was Facebook for getting the traction and everything. The problem with Facebook in that time, which was not uh, um, before I was not aware that it, it was happening that much, it has uh, artificial intelligence engaged in banning contact, contest. So basically you can be banned and nobody from Facebook will answer to you in one week or two weeks. And it's really, really hurtful. 
So basically that's something that happened to us early and you never find out why they just answer, oh, it's our error, sorry, and they let you in. But if that's something like that happens to you on the starting of a campaign, it could be re re really hurtful. So basically there is things that you should experiment earlier than you enter the campaign. And uh, as I said, it's very, very hard to get all the things uh, right because everything is moving and changing. And uh, so basically you, you have to, to see what the people in near past has done and worked because it can, it can be changed between, let, let's say, I think in one year, it could be different landscape altogether. Okay, I actually have two more short questions. Um, uh, so one would be, after this success, um, uh, have you been maybe approached by a, a bigger, uh, let's say, a production house or a distributor or for a licensing deal or something like this? And if, if you were, what was kind of your standpoint? Do you want to stay mm -hmm. like an independent, uh, let's say, pro production? Well, it, it, it is very, let's say, uh, how, can, how can I uh, get about this? It really depends on what kind of project you have, what kind of uh, experience and will to tackle all the problem of production you, 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 you are prepared to do. From my standpoint, uh, uh, as a first uh, Kickstarter and not a brand name or something like that, publishers and distributors, especially the, the big ones, are usually asking for too big share. So basically you got almost nothing if 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 I may so say so. So our case that we can go, so we turned out turn down almost all, all publisher deals that we have because it was re very uh, low percentage of reality. It's about four or five percent, which is basically nothing. So, so, so that's, that's where, where yeah. we are uh, with that. Yeah, that makes it uh, pretty clear. After so much effort, uh, I'm sure that like uh, getting such a small uh, share of the revenue would be super, super discouraging. And my last question would be, um, after you finish the cycle of this project, uh, do you already have the next plans and would it be like an upgrade of the existing game or an extension or something like this or you want to you are kind of encouraged to work on more projects and to kind of uh, pursue you know new areas or maybe topics and so on we we will do uh, exactly as just said so basically we will take a big break to let the game settle in to see the feedback and to see what what users really think when they get the game we now know what they think about graphical aspect we know what they think about our description of the game we know what the reviewers think but we don't know how it will go and play out uh, the user table and when we get that feedback we currently have only planned to do let, let's say extension a re reprint of this game because this game was developed around, this is seven, seven, seven full years. So basically we, we will enter in eight. So basically we are not uh, going to uh, run for another uh, very soon. So basically reprint and extension, and then we'll, we'll see if everything goes well and we will see what we'll, we'll do. So basically for now, we don't have big plans after this in terms of new big game or something like that. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And I want to congratulate you, of course, on the on the success. And I would invite uh, uh, anybody who would like to ask Ivan uh, anything or, or comment on, on their campaign. Uh, now, now is the time. Thank you very much. Nothing for now. Okay, maybe I will just ask Jess, were you maybe aware of, of this project um, before I sent it to you? Yeah, I was. <laughs> I think you guys did so amazing. 
Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, uh, one one uh, thing that I want to share as our personal impression, maybe maybe it would be valuable for others. So basically, uh, sometimes people, how can I say, go uh, for uh, emails and for uh, potential bakers uh, full throttle. So basically, it doesn't matter. Just give me much and much and much emails and they try to make it wider than it is really our exp uh, our experiences choose your audience wisely because you don't want to uh, get someone that don't like that type of game because you will probably get the haters and that's a big problem so basically try to be as clear as possible to the people what that game is and what is not. So basically, Forest of Radgos is not uh, resource planning. It's not some kind of pure logical, statistical, com competitive game. So basically, if you're looking for game to compete and be um, completely uh, independent from the luck, that's not your game. Please don't. So. But as far as it uh, uh, goes to be very positive and do the marketing for your game, do not uh, pretend that it's for all people because it's never this and you will get the people that you don't want. They won't bake in any how and you can get backlash because they will say, oh, it's stupid. Uh, how can you use dice? Because dice are so old time way of using the even if in your case or our case it was completely good for the the, the game that that won't change their mind okay thanks a lot ivan uh really really amazing we'll continue to follow um what, what is going on with uh, with your project and of course to to support it and uh, at this point i would like to invite dushan Dusan Vulovic to join us, and I hope it is okay for him also to continue in in Serbian. So Dusan is a, a long time marketing um, expert, and uh, he has an extensive experience in working both in our region and in China and um, on many different aspects of marketing and advertising. And over the last couple of years. He was focused very much on projects such as uh, crowdfunding.rs, which was the first, uh, uh, let's say, project and platform uh, dedicated to crowdfunding in Serbia. And he has recently uh, launched the project uh, Dobri Dabar, or in translation, Good Beaver, if I'm not wrong, um, uh, which is a new platform for crowdfunding in, in Serbia. So Dusan, are you still around, hopefully? I see that Dushan is here, but I'm not sure if uh, he can hear us. So just give me a minute to try and ping him in another way. So for now, I don't have any feedback. Uh, maybe we, we can wait another minute because I wasn't sure how to schedule the uh, participation because I couldn't kind of foresee the exaggeration of, of each of the sessions. So I'm just gonna do another try with Dushan and uh, then we'll see.
I called his colleague just to check if everything is okay with him. So just please bear with me another another minute. And otherwise we'll, we're going to wrap it up, but we'll know in a minute or two. Uh, in the meantime, of course, if you have any questions for either Ivan or Jess, uh, please use the opportunity. Mm, I can try asking a question if nobody else wants. Yeah, go ahead and then we can wrap it up after your chat, unless Dushan uh, shows up. Yeah, it, it looks like I have to wrap up every time. <laughs> um, so my question would be mostly regarding Kickstarter because uh, Mr. Ivan and as well as uh, Jess talked about the platform. And I feel like most of the talk was uh, based broadly on basic marketing terms like dialing in your target audience, using certain funneling systems, what's your top funnel, medium funnel, your end goal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what would be your from both of your perspectives what would be your best practices for kickstarter as a platform what do you feel like works best with their sort of audience uh, platform etc so for me the whole marketing of marketing works with kickstarter but like kickstarter specific you obviously like want to get in their newsletters you want to be one of the projects they love and for that, it's a combination of algorithms and bias. So on the algorithm side, like money coming in every day and hitting that 40% as fast as possible. So they know if they promote you, they're promoting a campaign that's likely to succeed because obviously they don't want to promote the like 70% of campaigns on their platform that fail. So that's number one. And then on the projects we love, like, email like contact them find the person that you can message like find someone that works at kickstarter in their customer support or whatever in their marketing team like you can do it on linkedin that likes games i mean it's kickstarter most of them are gonna like games but i mean if you found like if I, if, if ivan found like someone of serbian heritage or slavic heritage that liked that worked at Kickstarter, then of course they'd be like slapping a project we love on his campaign. And of course they would be using their, you know, privilege to get him in their newsletter and in the social media and chat to the other team members to say how awesome it is. So if you can find someone that works there and then find a bit of that common ground. And also just kind of emailing them with some questions like whether it's kind of, hey, we're launching a card game and it's all about cats and we're aiming to launch it in like June. Just wondering if you know if any other June campaigns are going live about cats that are get card games because we obviously don't want to be like competing at the same time. So they're aware of you, your existence, your business, what you're doing. And obviously they like start to understand like this guy knows what he's doing. He's not just going to put it on there and hope for the best. And then in that respect, you become a more trustworthy creator that is actually going to hit their target. So you're a safer bet for them to promote. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to think about that concept because I feel like a lot of people look at the platform and they basically see a, a wall of automation and they don't see the people behind it. So 
Um, I like the concept now that I, I will try to think about the people working for these platforms and making uh, a human connection with them as well, because they are also important for the whole process. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and from my part, uh, there is, uh, how can I say, there is a lot, lot of information about that, uh, what can get you a project we love, but as, as Jess said, it's, uh, let's say, mashup of all things that happens in this, that specific moment of time, and it depends of many, many, many things that nobody is really sure. So basically connection with someone from Kickstarter is just a plus, something that you should do. Uh, the, the one thing that I'm very aware that they are looking at and not from the perspective projects we love badge, but what they love to see is how many new bakers, the people that never came to Kickstarter you bring. So basically if you go on any project on Kickstarter in their statistics, you can check how many percentage of bakers or number of bakers, whatever you prefer to watch, they bring to Kickstarter. So basically the one who are already on Kickstarter is something that they are giving to you from their perspective. And the one that you bring with your marketing to Kickstarter, who never baked the Kickstarter is the one that you bring to them. So that's something that they value, that they watch, that, that's for sure. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, if, if I, uh, this, really uh, brings a new perspective in my mind because basically on one hand um, you have a Kickstarter and understanding that there are people behind them and trying to connect with them uh, and then from you even um, there's the also the other side of the coin is that that is their livelihood and you should also try to think from their perspective and try to basically coerce them or um Make them believe that your project is something that uh, is in their benefit to support as well. So <laughs> that is the same that Jess has suggested. So basically, the money coming in your project is money coming in in their uh, uh, pocket. So basically, money is the most the safest bet. What they like. So if if you are betting on something, bet on money. So basically, ten percent, not ten percent, but. 5%, but there is issues with Serbia, so you will give some percent more and so on and so on. But some percent is going to Kickstarter. So basically, the more you get to them, the better. And the things that they really like is uh, new people on Kickstarter, because the people that came to Kickstarter will fund the Kickstarter also very often next Kickstarter. So that, that's something that so basically from one point, it's easier to target the people that already know what is the Kickstarter because you don't have to explain them why and how, and you will never never have the problem what is Pledge Manager and how to approach that. And on the other hand, bringing some new fresh blood for the Kickstarter is uh, good from that perspective. So let's say that that it's good that you bring some new people, not only to target the, the, the Kickstarter uh, even if it's easier or safer or something like that. But definitely when you're doing the marketing, you should include Kickstarter in something that targets your market because that's the, the joint point. So yes, please do include Kickstarter as a tag for the marketing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we are ready to wrap up. Unfortunately, Dushan seems to be uh, signed out uh, for some reason. I hope that everything is all right with him. So I would like to uh, thank you all for joining today. I'd like to thank uh, Jess uh, and Ivan so much for, for sharing their experience. And of course, I would like to encourage you to uh, reach out to Jess, uh, who can um, uh, help you out with your uh, potential current uh, current projects. Oops, so we have Dushan. Let's see. <laughs> Last minute. So Dushan, if you can hear us, uh, you should join in and uh, present uh, your project, hopefully, if possible, in, in English. And we have some 10 to 15 minutes uh, left.
oldu. Okay. Hey guys. <laughs> okay, so if you want to share your screen, uh, should be enabled for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But not in this very moment. Hey. Okay, should I, should, I, should I continue in English? Okay. Yes, please. And we have around 10 to 15 minutes, so please try to be uh, brief. Yeah. It was yeah, it was a beautiful presentation from Jess. Uh, and thank you, Jess, for, 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 for being here. Uh, because crowdfunding is, it, 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 it gets a little bit difficult and uh, not so like being uh, very um, uh, friendly. Usually people get, uh, into crowdfunding, like being uh, very confident and like uh, we're gonna do it this way or another, but it's not really the truth. So, hi everyone, I'm Dushan from Dobri Dabar, Good Beaver <laughs> platform. Uh, we spend a, a ma immensely uh, incredible amount of time to to get to 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 this point. Uh, Dobri Dabra is a domestic platform, uh, and it's open to everyone. So I would take uh, this chance of ten minutes, fifteen minutes, to present ourselves, in order to share the screen and then to discuss what it is Dab Dobri Dabar. Dobri Dabar is open to everyone. The point is, if you are if you are thinking about any kind of crowdfunding, then you should think about: uh, is there any possibility for you to um, to start it anyway? So, just took a part of it, and we have this questionnaire which is called uh, the questionnaire to dis discuss the, the, the capacity uh, if you are unable to start the campaign. Then we start with an email, registration, the name of the organization and everything else. What is your legal status of the organization? And then to move towards the addresses of like um, social media, et cetera, et cetera. How many followers, blah, blah, blah. Business partners, which is very important. Team, which is very important. And then to move forward. Uh, the details, like to explain the idea how did you start with your idea? What is the example that you, what is the, what is the solution that you are providing in your idea? What, what is the difference? And the major thing is the money. One of the things that Jess explained previously is uh, the thing that the, you should rely on your community and the people that you know. Uh, as I said previously, when I was like, uh, can, I, can I add something? Actually, it's a, it's a, it's involves in purchase, like uh, if you want to succeed, you have to be aware and bold and brave in a way that uh, nobody did, did things before. You, should, you have to trust yourself and then to be in a way like, okay, I'm gonna marry this like, uh, for example, if you're a guy and you're gonna, gay, you're gonna marry <coughs> uh, uh, Paul Dancer, that's it. 
you have to stand behind it. So, also there is one thing that you have to know is like, uh, what, is the, what is the purpose of your purchase? Uh, how much money do you want to uh, raise? uh usually it depends on 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 the idea itself so uh you have to know your crowd uh, and then you have to follow it so if you're thinking about like 10 15 20 thousand whatever you have to stand behind it uh, the thing is what it's what it's good for crowdfunding is that you can check your idea in a very small amount of people followers and everything and everyone else so if you're not following your idea then you you cannot get your money actually so what i'm showing you here is the questionnaire on dobridabar.com which is a questionnaire that you can check the capacity uh, for your idea to start a campaign. So I would like to invite you all uh, to do this. Dobridabar is a platform which is uh, actually uh, open to everyone and suitable for everyone in Serbia namely so uh, what is happening right now in 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 crowdfunding is the idea that uh, the people can just check their idea through crowdfunding so if we're talking about this you cannot raise like fifty thousand euros easily on dobridabar it's not possible at the moment eventually it could be but if you're thinking about like good beaver, good dobridabar, then you can uh, have this questionnaire saying like spremni. The other thing is how it works. And the Jess mentioned majority of those things like tips and tricks and everything else. Uh, if you are willing to start your own campaign, then you can come here and start from the very beginning. If you can see, uh, we try to share everything to everyone, like who's gonna use platform Dobridaba, what is the terms of contract, and then like what it means to start a campaign as you can see here on the left side what is the 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 yeah, what we are open for certainly we're not open for pornography and uh, these kind of things but we are open for uh, socially acceptable ideas uh, and to provide solutions. So there is a questionnaire in this topic saying, uh, are you ready? This is my doggo. And then there is the other one saying how it works. And then on how it works, you have answer to all the possible questions that you can imagine and I would be very happy if you could contact us in order to provide the, the details about how to prepare. Usually what Jess said is uh, like you can, you, can, you can just easily uh, test your idea through crowdfunding. This is not only the promotional tool, it's just the tool like uh, if you're willing to uh, 
provide any kind of service, additional, uh, additional thing. Yeah, you should just go towards talk, towards crowdfunding and then decide about uh, either you are willing to uh, crowdfund your idea or not. Dushan, could I just ask you uh, maybe a, a question? Uh, because you've been involved in crowdfunding in, in Serbia uh, for a while, is this the uh, first platform of its port in Serbia? And uh, if yes or if not, doesn't matter, what, what would be the specific thing that you wanted to kind of uh, make available to the public? Yeah, thank you very much, Radek, for this question. The thing is, like, this is the first uh, crowdfunding platform which is uh, available to everyone. So either you are thinking about uh, testing your idea or like you are willing to crowdfund whatever, um, it's fine. We are open to everyone. We just found the solution in Serbian laws and regulations, which are not really actually related to donations only or whatever it is. And I would really like to take a question from uh, the from everyone, if there is any. Okay, so maybe I would just ask you for the end, uh, what would be the technical way uh, when it comes to, uh, to, to, to receiving payments and uh, uh, backings and uh, so on, because you mentioned that you had to work around that uh, in the legal framework. So- Yeah, hey, that's a very good question. Part. Thank you, thank you, Relia. Uh, we, we, we just managed to make a deal with the banking system that uh, uh, there, is, there is no like banking fee that we have to pay. So anyone who's ever thinking about crowdfunding uh, its own campaign on dobridabar.com, until the end of this year, eventually, probably uh, even more. Uh, there is no banking fees. Okay, that's that's great. So because we are practically out of time, I would suggest we uh, wrap it up uh, for now. I will also, uh, if anybody would like to uh, get Dushan's contact, uh, I can follow up uh, on that. And of course, we are inviting you to uh, check out the uh, Dobri Dabar uh, platform. So thanks Dushan also for joining. And once again, uh, thanks everyone. And we'll be continuing in two weeks time when we are going to talk about uh, investing and investments as um, another different uh, source and avenue of funding for uh, video game projects and game projects in general. So I invite you to follow SGA uh, homepage and of course social media channels. So until then, um, all the best and uh, have a great week. Oh,